Well, hello, Ghost Caitlin. Hello. Or Caitlin. <laughs> Kayla. It's Kayla. 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 Oh, my God. <laughs> I respond yeah, to it all. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, Mrs. Good. K. <laughs> Anything with the K sound? Yeah, just say K. I'll show. So we have Marcus. Marcus, I whisper yes, to you. So what's the matter? You don't like the taste of fish? <laughs> I, I, I don't. <laughs> Not any kind of fish. <laughs> that was so funny. If Philip wasn't there, I would have gone to town on that. You know that. Hi, oh, please, like he doesn't know that. Shall we get started? Sure. Hey. Oh, yeah. Should I give like a few more minutes, maybe? How do you do that usually? Do you jump on the table? No, you just stay there. It's fine. I just stay there. Okay. Yeah. We know who who's talking. I'm gonna go on that side then. <coughs> so I can see. Great, now I get whiplash between you and the slides. I can double check. <laughs> I can check my what's displayed. Do you want me to be next to the board? Is that yeah, making more like sense? You feel more yeah, yeah. especially connected yeah. to that? Yeah, yeah, do it. It's easier to film that way. Too. All right, <coughs> I can do that too. Thank you, Sam. Hello, Brad. Hello, Jasmine. Hey, Kay. All right, are we ready? Yes. Do you think we have a quorum? Yes. Yes? No? Maybe? Woohoo! Yay! Okay. <laughs> Speaking though, please silence hey. your mic so we don't get keyboards Sorry? and whatnot. Please silence Sorry? your mic. Thanks. Do you hear me correctly? Yes. Yeah, cool. Alright, let's do it then. Alright, thank you everybody. Uh, so, this is it. Um, I've been asked to give you a, a walk on the engine side and try to describe into more details uh, uh, what we have uh, up and running in client in the interface. Um, so my name is Sam. I'm Sam Gatto, if you don't know me yet. I've been uh, uh, with Hyfidity for the last uh, five years almost. And I'm, um, I'm the tech lead on the, on the core engine team. Boom. So, what are the, the goals of this presentation is, I mean, the way I've, I've been asked to present it was to uh, basically give you that map of the interface architecture from the point of view of the real-time engine. So I'm not, I'm going to omit a bunch of systems because they don't really matter for what I, what I care about, which, which is the real-time experience. I'm going to try to describe for you the, the components and the task which together or making that uh, gameplay experience that you are, uh, that's what you are swimming in basically. And we're going to do a zoom into the graphics engine and the rendering pipeline uh, because uh, I've heard a lot of questions about that and basically I'm here to answer your question. And of course, this is not going to be uh, enough because it's only one hour so we won't go into too much details about like shaders, GPLib and all that. That's just too low level. And that's not really like the point. I could do a presentation about that in a later session. We the this is not the exact reality of the current implementation, but because it's a simplified description, but that should give you a, a good understanding of what happens and why it's happening like that. And and of course things are not exactly that. And it's not comprehensive because I don't know I don't know everything. There is a lot of things that I still don't understand. And it, you know, it takes a village basically. We're a large team, and everybody's contributing, and even you. So that's what it is. So that's that's my the goal for that presentation. So let's dive right in into the uh, architecture of the interface. So very high level uh, slides to kind of introduce the, the landscape. Interface is iFi's client, which connects to the metaverse. You know that. Mm -hmm. Interface is a native app, so interface exe that runs on a combination of the hardware and the software stack, like the OS, the drivers, whatever um, um, specific SDK you have in there for such and such uh, devices. So that's the platform. 
And basically what Interface does, is it performs that real-time interactive rendering and simulation of the that visited corner of the virtual world. That's the content. So right now we're, we're all logged in into Roundtable and basically that's what each of yours interface is delivering to you, that real-time interface of that corner of the metaverse. All right. Feel free to, to, uh, to ask question if it's not clear, if you don't understand my pronunciation. Uh, here again, uh, trying to zoom in a little bit more on the interface XZ uh, specifically. So what do we really mean by that real-time interactive rendering and simulation of content? Well, what we mean is that real-time is that notion of that the application keeps uh, running that loop uh, at noisum, non-stop slices of time that we call the frame. Each frame is a little bit as a little bit length as it, sorry, each frame is a little length of time, about 10 milliseconds when we're going fast. Uh, 20 or 30 milliseconds we're going slower and basically the frequency at which those frames are produced is called the frame rate so that's what uh, represented by that uh, spinning arrows then we got the content that's all the data all the assets the scripts the avatars description the entities description the behaviors uh, which are all together or creating that uh, that universe and these are content because all of that is content. I mean, the engine runs uh, fed by content. The, the engine doesn't know anything. It's not like we're, we don't have any notion of, oh, there's a floor here, just right there. No, there's no floor. The floor comes from the content. The fact that there is a skybox comes from the content. There is no skybox. There is no, there is no, there is no uh, background for the image, just the default one. And so the interactive rendering simulation is basically that gameplay that I was uh, alluding to, which is that user experience and the rules and behaviors that which are making all that glue together. So I would argue that the gameplay is a high level uh, concept. It's basically what we make out of that application with the high level objects, such as entities and avatars and the interaction you can make on them. But really, at a low level, in terms of just pure crunching numbers, producing images, uh, doing physical simulation, these are like core engines which don't really know about what what are the semantics of those gameplay objects. It doesn't really make a di any difference to the rendering engine whether you're rendering a floor of an entity or a table or your avatar. It's pretty much the same thing. Any questions so far? All right, here again, the content. So this is just like me, like trying to give you, uh, like give you the high level semantics that I was alluding to. We got the entities, we got the avatars. These are like probably like the two main things we're, we're dealing with. And then uh, a bit more subtle, the interactions of uh, things like, which are, uh, whether it's like teleport objects, widgets, uh, stuff like that, which are happening on the client which are probably, which are, which are content because they are coming from the description of scripts or the type of um, experience that we're creating through the, the world. And an identity of this one, I don't add a, a good word for that, but basically that notion that, um, that you have an identity, we understand the session, the session that you represent connected in the metaverse. So there's a unique identity, there's the wallet associated with it and your inventory. So that is also a, a piece of content. And so the gameplay is basically that intersection between those uh, content high uh, gameplay objects and the game loop. Game loop is basically that rendering, uh, that sorry, that real time loop that we're trying to execute like every uh, ten, uh, every ten milliseconds when everything goes well. In reality, we're going a bit slower for the game loop, going around 30, 30 milliseconds. And, but really, this is performed in, in truth by <laughs> a few core engines. And we're not gonna go through that list right now yet, but that just gives you a sense of how many things we have like powering uh, that experience. So at a simple, um, from the point of view of the user or point of view of people like swimming in the universe, in, in, in the world of affinity, you're experiencing the gameplay and the rules are 
and the rules and objects you're dealing with are the what's on the green side, the gameplay. But under the hood, uh, with all those different core engines and all those different like uh, breakdown of objects and engines, that's what's really happening by and what's really run by by the client. And these are like the core engines. So that's where the, the our team is working in mostly. Does that make any sense so far? Any question? All right, moving on. So now we're going to try to describe what happens during a typical game loop. And you're going to see all the different core engines in action, hopefully, trying to work together. That's the walkthrough uh, through a game loop. So typically, and here again, this is not the exact way things are happening. It's more like a conceptual understanding of the architecture. Uh, typically, we synchronize with the server. So through the network engine, we're going to get uh, the updates from the different servers, whether it's the audio, avatars, entities, uh, and so forth. And we get a, we're going to get like what has changed from a viewpoint. So as I'm looking at you here, or as I am uh, moving around, you guys constantly receive my updates for the avatar. Same for the audio. And when I'm going to go and click, uh, on and, and change the change the page of that web page here, you guys are going to see that. Um, a step which is a little bit like uh, subtle is about scheduling. So what do we mean by that? We need to every frame trying to uh, load balance where we're going to spend our time. This is that notion of evaluating the time budget we're going to spend for the next steps and internal like uh, uh, engines based on our understanding of what's in front of me. For example, here I am in my 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 client is running in front of a, a small group of people of I don't know like 40 people. So I'm going to probably dedicate a little bit more uh, energy and time spent on the avatar dealing with the avatars rather than the rest of the entity. And I understand that through that step, a step of scheduling and understand a notion of spatial level of detail for computational cost. Ta -da. So this is, uh, this, is, um, this is very specific to us. It's called, we call that engine the workload and the workload run on a, on a representation of the scene, which is called the space. From the schedule, what we get is a bunch of numbers that inform how much time we, we will want to spend on the next uh, phases of the game loop. Then typically we would deal with the, all the user inputs interactions. In this case, they can come from multiple source, um, the GUI through the QML and HTML, some scripts, uh, the controllers, when you pre especially when you're using the trackers, they directly impact what happens. And the picking, which is um, uh, the picking, uh, or what what happens when we want to be able to to do the teleports, or uh, just clicking and, and moving around objects. So at this point, uh, we think we have collected all the um, inputs from the client for the frame whether they come from network or from my local activity, like as I moved, as I clicked, as I interacted with the controllers. And we think we have a state which is ready to run the simulation on. So we're gonna run uh, at least the simulation for my avatar where we're gonna do the IK thing, especially if you're like gear, uh, geared up with the, the trackers. We're gonna perform the animations for uh, all the avatars in my vicinity, so I see you guys moving around a little bit because that's happening during that step. And then uh, on the rest of the entities, we're going to uh, apply the uh, physics collision system, the uh, kinematic for things which are moving but not colliding. And from that, we're going to get a state of the scene, which is considered done for the, for the, for the rest of the frame. All changes are settled at this point for this frame. From the simulation changes, we are now able to update the gameplay objects. So now that we've like we've done all our computation and 
our idea of okay that time slice is done we've computed everything now we can inform back the gameplay objects of this is, my, this is your position and this is where you're going to be considered at for the rest of the the frame and then here if you were to be moving an object through because you grabbed an object um, that's when uh, that object would have received that new position and potentially you would trigger a network synchronization. I presented that earlier in the in the in the steps, but that could happen anytime really. And finally, because the gameplay objects are settled, everything in the scene a scene that we want to know is known, we can dispatch all the changes to the pure rendering uh, audio and graphics engines and scenes. What I mean by that is the audio and audio scene that are presented here and the graphics and graphics scene, you, you, you basically describe the world and they just like crunch on that and produce for you the rendered of their rendered artifact uh, for rendering for graphics. Of course, it's going to be the final image that we're looking at for audio is going to be that whatever is the blend of different audio sources we add mixed with my own input and whatnot. And that's what comes to my headphone. And so graphics engine specifically, because that's what what's going to come next, of course, graphics engine will render this. Also, by the way, I don't know nothing about audio. <laughs> so <laughs> don't even try asking me a question. I have no idea how that works. Uh, this is Ken Sturf. Uh, graphics and engine will render the scene into an image Ta -da! which is showing up here. All right. Does that make sense so far? Any question? Um, if you have more questions about the game loop, what happens during game loop, it might be a good opportunity to take, take some questions, but otherwise we're going to go and move on to the graphics engine. So I'm going to leave you like five seconds to raise the... I have, a, I guess, a quick question. Yeah. Um, uh, how threaded is the game loop? Um, is that try to do as much as possible in a single thread or...? So the game loop is, we're trying to time budget it. So in a different chunks of work we have to do there. So they fit within the, the time budget that we have. So the time budget is realistically uh, 30 milliseconds that we're trying to fit into uh, because that that's when we run at 30 Hertz for the game loop. Um, if you crank up the stats, uh, it depends, like sometimes we are f faster than what we have to do and then we can run faster. That's, um, do you know about the stats you can show by with the slash key? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's the game rate that I'm talking of. Um, so so this is, I mean, the game loop itself, like that sequence that I described, it is happening on its own, it, it, it's happening on the main thread right now. But the some of those engines um, or that I that I described, which are like you know, dispatching stuff, or dig some of them, or they're on their own thread, and they would happen uh, at a different on a different time uh, timeline, basically. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any more question? All right. Right on. So let's talk about the graphics engine now. So when we talk about the graphics engine, we this is basically a, a bag of a few uh, high-level objects. We have first the, the scene. That's what I called the graphics in, graphic scene previously, uh, because I come from a graphics background. For me, that's the scene. Um, that's a database, which is spe specialized, by the way. It's like optimized for, for a special location. It's a database of all the graphics objects and their description. And we are modifying that scene through what we call transactions. Because it's a database, it's it's somewhat thread safe from the point of view of the game loop. So game loop can uh, queue up a bunch of transactions to modify what's inside of that scene. And then the rendering engine, the render engine, is that's 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 the real engine. That's the thing which is updating the scene with the latest transaction from the gameplay. And from that, we're producing batches, which are basically GPU commands 
like batches of GPU command, um, which are describing in um, if you want, if you want, in terms of like OpenGL commands or Vulkan commands, or but really we're talking in terms of GPU lib commands, uh, describing like the sequence of draws we're gonna trigger and which will produce the frame the sorry the rendering the, the image we're currently re looking at and that's the current frame and then that uh, GPU batch those GPU batches sorry are taken of or picked up by another engine which we call the present engine and this guy is the one who is responsible for getting it to the driver, <laughs> getting those commands to the driver through the GPU API, and taking care of the final steps for compositing uh, potentially with the various uh, flavors of displays we can we, we have to deal with, and do the final presentation uh, to your eyes. Right. So another view of that same thing, the game loop produces the scene transactions. These are the changes to the scene that's consumed by the render engine, which will update the scene accordingly and will then produce GPU batches, which are the description of the commands we need to execute in the present engine to produce the final image. Ta-da! Amazing. Well, I think you knew all of that, right? So now let's let's go and describe a little bit more what's inside the scene, and what we're going to find inside the scene uh, is all those like uh, graphical representation of all the gameplay objects, and those graphical representation know nothing about the gameplay objects. They have no notion of entities. They know nothing about avatars. They are pure render items. By the way, that's how we call them: the render items. So the render items, they are uh, that's the atom which is living inside that scene database. They represent a thing in a 3D world with its bounding box typically, and that's how we can f quickly know what's in front of us with fr uh, frost cutting and stuff like that because we're just dealing with render items. And when, when I say that, what I mean by that is we're really dealing just with a larger array of bounding boxes. And um, if you were experienced with with developing and coding such uh, such algorithm, you know that you don't want to know about like all the ins and outs of what's inside the, those objects. You'd rather have just a, a flat array of bounding boxes to be able to quickly do the crunch the mass and returns to you a list of indices that tells you, okay, among those thousand boxes that you gave me, I can f I think from that viewpoint I can see hundred. And this is the list of the indexes, indices of those 100 in there. So that's why, why we're doing that. So render item are like really like that they represent things, but they are not that thing. And so they also have a specific type which expose uh, simple features. Um, so a concrete example of that, uh, not of the type, I, I'll, I'll come back on that later. But um, uh, so for example, a sphere entity that would be represented by one render item because it's and, and that's what I meant when I said simple feature. Uh, when we're talking about a render item, which is going to be used to represent something, call that a shape. Well, we want that shape to be that shape render item to be extremely simple. So that's why we say one draw call. And one draw call that means uh, one piece of mesh, one material at one position. Period. And so a sphere entity that's perfect because that's that's exactly that. That's just a very very well understood uh, geometry sphere. We probably have stored somewhere in a, some sort of a cache for the geometries for the primitives. The material for that is it could be complex. It could be the simple default one. That doesn't matter. It's just one material and then a position. That's it. That's the position we have it. So yeah, a sphere entity is just one render. Item. A model entity, on the other hand, we often separate that into multiple render items. And the reason for that is that you could have like many different parts in a typical model which don't have the same materials, they are not in the same mesh, uh, they could have different styles of mesh, like by that I mean some mesh could be deformed, 
some mesh are not necessarily deformed, especially with avatars. You have, uh, as an avatar, you have a bunch of your your body is typically like a skin and, and blend shaped uh, mesh, whereas you could have accessories or like maybe some 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 solid uh, objects that you carry around uh, around your avatars, which is not. So all of that makes we need to separate those into parts, and we, we each of those different combination of geometry, material, and position, we're going we're gonna to have to create a render item for it. Any questions so far? Roger. No. Sorry, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Again, sorry. No, no, no um, problem. Um, for that. And I, I'm, I'm probably going to mangle nomenclature, so I apologize for that. No, but no, I'm no. just curious, when you're, when you're talking about render items, let's say you have multiple uh, materials, for example, but well, you have a single material that's used right. multiple times in a scene. Is right. reuse for that possible, and is that done? So the, the same material is reused for several render items, because maybe those render items, those shapes like you, uh, the, that you are describing, sorry, those objects that you are describing, they maybe do not belong from the same uh, geometry or the same parts. So what we would do is we would create like probably one render item for each of the combination of geometry and material. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. It's just, uh, especially looking at your graph here, it's like you've got two wheels, right? Right, exactly. Like... So, exa oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I should have used the, the I should have used the drawing. That's why, that's why I made that. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, yes, the, the wheels probably are exactly the same mesh. Hopefully, right. uh, the, whether it's through Blender or Maya, or you found that on Sketchfab, and the uh, artist was not too, uh, <laughs> too crazy. And, it just created like a, a single instance of the wheel, and then that wheel is just like instance in the sense that we are reusing four times the same geometry, probably four times the same material, I would assume, but that's going to be a different position. And so we also need to track that. And the transform, the position at which something is, that account for uh, one more render item. Okay. That makes sense. You could have also the case of same geometry, different transform, and different materials, and that would also make several render items, of course. Um, what we are trying to work on is to actually accelerate that case, by the way. The case of same geometry, the instancing case, sorry, where everything is the same except for transform we are working on that. We want to be able to render a large number of trees in a forest and you keep that individual uh, instancing, uh, sorry, this individual representation of each instances, but we are able to still uh, render that more efficiently than if you were to do one draw call for each individual trees. Wonderful. That's exactly the sort of thing I was fishing for. <laughs> Thank you. This is good. We're getting somewhere. <laughs> All right. Can I move on? All right. I'm moving on. Uh, I'd be, I'll come back on, on more details on the render item. Don't worry. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to present before we, we dive deeper in the render item is the notion of transaction. So a transaction express the change you want to apply to a render item, and it's typically implemented through a lambda function. And what that means is that every frame the, the gameplay is going to queue up many many different transactions uh, as i'm looking at you again i see that every one of you is typically at least changing its position a little bit so for every avatar we're probably going to have like one transaction that touch on their hopefully one render item maybe more render item which are which needs to be updated because like your bounding box uh, the bounding box that represents you is changing constantly and that's fine we're dealing with that so the gameplay queues many uh, transactions reflecting the changes of the game objects to their render items alter ego. Um, I'm going to pause there. I use that word because I'm, I'm a fancy French ass, but if you don't understand, I can explain to you. <laughs> what I mean by that is that... <laughs> I was joking on myself, by the way. Huh? <laughs> um, 
what I mean by that is that. Mais oui. Uh, what I meant by that is that render items, they know nothing about their game object. That's not that's not the way the relationship exists. The render items are just there to be to say, hey, I'm a graphics piece of stuff. I can render stuff. Boom. Next time the the camera look at me, I can I can be there present and be rendered. So it it has to come from the game object and so from the gameplay side that we inform all the modification we need to do, all the updates we need to convey to from the game object, like an avatar talking to several render items, or a sphere entity talking to a single render item, to 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 tell that render item, hey, you need to move around, you need to move to that new location, and so forth, and so forth. So all those transactions, it could be a large number, and in some cases, that's one of our, uh, it could be a bottleneck of ours, of course, but they are executed in bulk during an early step of the render engine. So you see that the render engine is in charge of like transferring those transactions on the arrow to the scene. And then what's cool is that with that uh, approach is that you have like a one critical section point to update everything in the scene that, you're, that surrounds you because you don't have to update everything. And the scene data after that is unmodified after this update. And so that means that we guarantee that the scene is, is immuted, is not muted, unmodified, sorry, is read only for, for the rest of the rendering frame. So again, to illustrate the, how we use the transaction, if I had to move that sphere and change its color, well, I would pass on, I would create from the gameplay side a transaction Typically, that's what's happening inside the sphere entity when we, when say from the script, from the script you could move that uh, position of that sphere or change its color. Well, there is the layer that understands that from the entity point of view, and then that gets translated and say, oh, I need to tell my render item that I need to change this and that. So that's when it's happening. So you see the transaction is expressed targeting the its sphere render item associated because the, the 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 because the game object knows about the render item not the other way around and in the lambda which is the payload of that transaction it does whatever the code whatever code it wants to do such as hey i'm gonna go modify the position of the transform go modify the color and so on and so all those different like tiny lambdas that's what gets uh, applied on the scene uh, every frame. Voilà. Before I move on, any question about that? All right. So there are different types of render item. Uh, so far, we've mostly um, described the shapes. So you can you see. <coughs> We have the shape type, which is one mesh part, one material, one transform, one draw call. I, I missed the one draw call thing, but that's that's really what it should be. So that's our atom of things which are that we can draw in the scene. They're also light. Uh, so in the same way uh, we are representing uh, shapes with render item, all the local lights and also the zones or injected in the scene as light, type light, render item. And then I, I will go on the description a bit, a bit later, so I'm going to refrain from going deeper. Uh, we also have the camera. So typically you have like two cameras, which are um, similarly like just like from the point of view of the scene, it's just like a render item that just say, hey, I'm covering that region of the world. And probably some of the uh, description of the configuration of the views that I want to use. And so when we move the camera, you would want to move the, that uh, corresponding render item. And we have another type of uh, render item, which we call the meta which is the group, a group of render items to be able to be the master of many. And, we'll, and one thing we enc encounter often is 
on one hand, we want to be able to have those uh, these models, such as the truck, being exploded into many separate render items. That's cool. But sometimes we want to be able to consider that group of render items as one. And if you remember, uh, one, ex one practical use case for that was when we introduced the cutting of uh, anything that was belonging to the avatar. So that was a bit, maybe two years ago, no, I don't remember. Uh, when we didn't have that meta in place, we were not able to curl uh, the avatars as a group of render items. And now we can, thanks to that feature. And a render item can also be of several types at the same time, which makes it for a cool, uh, a cool, a cool, a cool way to um, be able to to serve multiple uh, purposes at the same time for one from render item from a single render item. So, for example, that sphere entity that was uh, using as an example is a shape and a meta. So, we also use the meta indicate to 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 detect what is the, the high level uh, objects. And so, this is useful to reflect on on in a render item, hey, that render item matches one of the high level game objects. And so that's that's where we're using the system the way it is to to bring back some of that semantic into the render items. At least uh, understanding that you are a master of something. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? And so base sorry? How's the master defined? Um, when when I was describing how a model entity, such as that truck, is being exploded into all the shape render items it needs to be rendered, then on top of that, we're adding one more render item, which is called the meta of the model. And that meta render item of the model is constantly tracking the uh, typically the entity information. And it's not nearly it's not visible. So a pure meta run item would not be something that we draw. Uh, we could, and I'm sure you've 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 used some of the tools sometimes to inspect and see what's there. And some of those tools they rely on that. It's not because we it's in a normal rendering system we are not displaying anything about the meta, but it's very easy to introduce a way to say, oh, I'd like to show the bounding box of all the meta, and Basically, that's that, that's what we have available. Okay. And so, based on all those different types, the render item, when it's processed by the render engine, can go different roads. So, that that's where shapes they're going to be like uh, curled against. We're going to curl against the camera view first time, and we're going to decide from what's in the scene what 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 is the bag of render item I want to render, and then those shape render item will be sorted between the opaque Cassie. versus the transparent. Cassie. Yeah. <laughs> between the translucent and opaque. Opaque ones and then uh, we can have then the rendering of one by one we're gonna go and grab their information, the mesh, the material, the transform, and render them and execute that draw call. But then, guess what? When we render the shadow maps, we need to do the same thing again with a different configuration of rendering. But the same system applies, basically. Like, you can, uh, you can you're going to be able to grab from the scene a bunch of objects again and again in a fairly, uh, if, without having to go too much into the details, because you have all the information you need from those types and the bounding box. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, somebody is like shushing. <laughs> um, and so, um, right. Well, I w I don't want to go too much in, into details there, but um, I I'll, I'll be I'll be happy to answer a question if they comes. All right. So now, um, right. So the render engine. Do you see that by the way? I don't see it. Yeah. The render engine performs the render loop. That was obvious. The render engine runs on its own thread, so it's a, so now we're like cutting loose, uh, we're cutting away from the the main thread, which is dealing with the game loop, and we're on our own thread. Of course, it's called the render thread. Ta -da. 
and uh, as I've described earlier, it consumes the transactions to update the scene from the scene and input render arguments, which are like, uh, I don't know, you see my mouse? Oh yeah, you see my mouse, cool. So here are the render arguments and the transaction coming from the gameplay. Render arcs basically carry what we want to look at, like what is the active camera view we want to look into to produce the GPU batches. And so that gets consume, update the scene, go through different passes to deliver, add in of that, the GPU batches that will perform the actual rendering in the present engine. I know this is high level. I'm going to pause here because I'm going to jump to the next engine and we'll come back to the to the notion of render engine. Okay. So the present engine performs ta -da, the present <laughs> loop. <laughs> By the way, wh again, when you look at the stats, you'll see those numbers. On the fourth column on the right, you see engine, batch, and GPU. Uh, well, engine is the render thread, the render engine thread. Batch is typically what the time we spend doing that present loop. Not exactly, but almost. On the first column, we have another one called the render rate and the present rate. So render rate uh, basically tells you how fast we come back to render engine and present rate tells you how fast we come back to uh, present loop. So back to present engine. Present engine, it also runs on its own thread. So now we are like adding, we have added like two more threads. It consumes the GPU frame batches that were produced by the rendering engine and then it's going to execute those GPU commands through the GPU context and its backend. So the GPU context is uh, is part of the GPU lib uh, library, and that's our abstraction to the uh, true graphics API we're using under the hood. So that's where the we have different GL. Sorry, yes, we have different GL backends. We have the four or five that we use typically on NVIDIA and AMD. We have uh, the backend for one that we're using on Mac OS and uh, on Intel. And also the GLES that we have, uh, uh, that's, that's the one we're using for uh, Android. So at the end of the work, at the end of the execution of all the commands that were batched into that GPU frame coming from the previous stage, we get uh, basically the driver has been starting to work, has started to work, and then at the end of that, we have uh, the display plugin which is taking over and grab the final frame, aka final image, sorry, apply last compositing that it wants to do. Sometimes it's specific to the types of display plugin we're dealing with, and that's when we do the final present. Right. Any question about that? I don't want to go too much into the details of what happens in present engine and a present thread. This is, like I said uh, in introduction, this is m way too much details uh, and happy to make a presentation or um, doesn't have to be me on, on the internal guts of that in a, a further date. And boom, the image is there. Haha! -ha! And I had a secret outline, uh, a secret mo one more thing that I wanted to get to if I had time. It seems that I have time, so I'm going to go through that. But okay, Sam, you described us like the high level concept. Okay, give us some meat here. What's really, what is that engine thing I keep referring to? And this is really applied to the render engine because that's where we first started developing that concept. So the render engine is implemented with a data-oriented job framework. It's available in the task lib of the repo. And um, if you're look, starting looking at that, you're seeing, oh, a bunch of jobs, data-oriented, what does that really mean? 
looks like there is a bunch of job working together and that's what you call the vendor engine what is that job thing a job represents a function uh, just like a simple function like run do something which is going to ex be executed on the input data and which will produce output data so far so good so it's just like a function but it's we think of it as a job and the important fact the important thing is that the input is read only so we're never going to modify what, what whatever data comes in and the output can be created from the job itself that that's the data that you are creating generating from the job or you could pass on uh, an input if you wanted and those input and output data, which are uh, at the in and out of the jobs, we're going to call them varyings. And if you're familiar with the concept of varying in a shader, this is the exact same idea. This means like data that lives just in the pipeline in between shaders. In this case, this is data that lives just, at just in the pipeline between two jobs. The output varying V of a first job A can become the input of another job B. It means that the job A is executed first, and once it is done, it passes on the varying V to the job B. So that means that this expressing that connection, and that this is something that we do statically uh, from, from the code, we are describing the interconnection of those jobs to the varyings. Once we have that described, this means that the notion of ordering of the work job A needs to be done before I can move on to job B is explicit from that uh, connection and that description of the graph. And what happens is that if you respect that, that, that ordering, that means that the varying V will never be touched by job B until it's ready to go. And not only that, but you could also uh, pipe in that varying V to two jobs, like a new job C, which doesn't know nothing about job B and doesn't care about what it is doing. Maybe job C just want to do a printf, doesn't have to know, doesn't have to do the whatever, doesn't have to know anything about what job B is doing. So what, what that means is that once the job A is done, both jobs B and C, they can start working at the same time on the same input. And then that's cool because that's exactly what we need to be able to crunch numbers in a multi-threaded context. So when we group uh, jobs together, that gives us a task. So at some point, it's going to become more and more complex. I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with the notion of a node and graph of nodes. Uh, whether it's for shader editing uh, or in Blender, <laughs> many different uh, places where it's used now. And that's, you need a way to bundle those into a, a higher level one. And so that's what the task does. As we interconnect more jobs together with varings, we are describing graph, a graph of jobs. And so we want to be able to abstract that away because it's cool why we are developing the feature but maybe you want to combine a bunch of jobs together to produce a higher level feature. And that, that's what the task does. And you can decide how the in and out of the task are going to be connected to the inner in and outs of the ins inside uh, job graph. And so what's cool with that is that the task behaves just like another job. So you, don't, you only have to care about that once you're like, trained to abstract away. But once you're abstracted and you're happy with that abstraction, you don't need to go further, dig deeper. And the same principle applies of ordering and dependency of the ordering, ordering of the dependencies. And so the root task of a job graph is an engine, and the render engine is implemented with such a graph of jobs. So the render, the input or the scene transaction that we've talked of earlier, and the render arcs, which are asking for such view, view being rendered with such camera setup and so forth. And the output of that is the GPU frame of batches. 
And there are many, many jobs that constitute our rendering pipeline, our rendering engine. And we have tools to go and inspect that. So when I look at this view of the world of that uh, from that tool, which is called engine inspector.js, which is this is available from the scripts in the developer menu. If you type engine inspector.js, you would, you would find it in uh, developer utilities render. This is describing uh, in just like a standard like tree view what or the uh, what is the organization of the jobs we're having here right now running uh, running in in master I just captured that that snapshot like uh, 57 minutes ago so <laughs> this is it and so the engine job that as we show can be reflected from the JS API we have tools for that and that lets us explore what's happening because I've I've glossed over a lot of details of what's possible to 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 extract, but we you, you, we could basically produce views such as like a graph node and editing graph node and stuff like that. It's just just more work. Maybe one of you guys won't, would want to pick that up. And with that, this is it. Um, I I'd be happy to. Thank you. Sure. Well, people are just talking, so uh, at least one or two things are happening. One, the audio uh, system needs to do its job. At the bare minimum, that's not rendering. So if I go back to the uh, uh, full list of the core engines, da 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 da, -da uh, yeah, at least you would know somehow. Like as you speak, uh, I didn't really represent that, but basically that is some sort of interaction input that comes from uh, the audio mic that needs to be digested and played back into network. So when you speak, you, we're doing that, but th that's fine. I mean, that's cool. Um, another side effect of speaking is that probably your avatar is going to start uh, animating its blend shapes for its face. And so in a static scene where nothing moves except for, for two people talking, that's, that's kind of what you would expect to see in terms of like constant updates happening. In terms of changes, yes. So if your question is at the intersection, so let me go back. To, by the way, when I when we say transaction coming from the from the gameplay getting into the scene and the graphics engine, that is what I meant by that dispatch here. Dispatch between the gameplay, the game loop, and the graphics engine. That when we are like producing those transactions and the they are queued into the into the graphics engine and then they will be digested. Um, so to answer your question, um, that would make for a much slimmer list of transactions. So yes, that would mean that only we only like only two objects are moving around basically. In an ideal case, like like you're describing, which would mean that uh, from the rendering point of view, from the rendering engine point of view. I'm going to go back to that slide where <laughs> uh, too much fun with that. If you look in this view, you see the top level tasks that we have from the root of the engine. We have first collect stats. Okay, cool. It's not really producing work. It's it's just like capturing information that we can reflect. Next, update scene. So that's where in update scene we are going to be able to uh, execute that, um, that consume those transactions and apply them to the render items of the scene. So that would mean that in the ca case that you're describing that you would have like much less work to do in that, in that update scene. Then rendering in itself is not really affected because you're still dealing with the same things in front of you. 
you could you could think of the rendering as you start from a frozen world and that's when you do the the rendering so anything animation that happens anything about like motion and animation that the shoot happens in the update scene stage of the render engine so sam one other way you could say it is that it's very unusual there's there's very few scenes in which nothing is actually changing yeah Right. I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the room, and sure, the room's not changing, but uh, Chaos's hair is bouncing around. I don't know everybody by names, but plenty of people are running flow scripts right now. Plenty of people are turning around, looking at the screen, looking at Sam, looking at me. Um, they're all playing idle animations. Um, all of that is absolutely um, causing both simulation as well as uh, transactions to change the scene state and then ultimately change the rendering. And then, of course, if you're wearing an HMD, um, your head pose is constantly changing at, at right. 45 to 90 hertz. And although there's some things that we do take advantage of uh, where we don't have to recreate the entire scene, um, it's often the case that as you move your head, as you move your head, uh, you're also essentially changing the perspective of the scene, and that's this, that's almost equivalent to changing the scene. So the headline is, you're never in a static scene. Does that sound fair, Sam? This is totally fair, monsieur. <laughs> um, I mean... Tell me, tell me, is there more? I mean, of course there is more you want to know, for sure. Uh, how can I help you uh, get more? Like, shall we do another round like that in a week, in two weeks? Oh, that would be awesome. That'd be cool. What do you want us to focus on? Hmm. I'm a little bit fascinated by the fact that uh, the... Uh, the render jobs are exposed in JavaScript. I didn't realize that. Um, and you just don't have time right now to <laughs> go into anything more. So, um, I mean, that would be somewhere I'd want to start. Right. I mean, this. I feel like I, I needed to do that, that dive from the zoom out, total zoom out, down to like those uh, level of details and not go further because there's so much that you can describe with that. And everything is like somewhat intertwined, so uh, I felt like I needed to give you that big road map first, or big map, sorry, then zoom in uh, slowly, and then zoom specifically into the region of rendering. Uh, I don't see why not. I also think, um, I'm pretty sure, Kayla, you were here videotaping the whole thing, right? Awesome. Yes, I am. So, we, so the video will be posted online uh, for sure. Cool. I, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, how is it that sometimes some of these objects or entities are seen by people in different locations? Mm -hmm. So sometimes, sometimes it is uh, that uh, I added, for example, with my, my penguin, some people could see it and other people could not see it, and, and, and it will be in different locations like that. That's almost always a bug. Like, that really shouldn't happen. And mm. I, unless you've done, s unless you're doing something with like local entities or something like that, which are more for, you know, overlays. So, um, that's a good point, maybe to mention, is that local entities, uh, they work the exactly the same way from the point of view of the core engines. There is nothing that, uh, behaves differently for them. So that's where local entity versus uh, server entity, that's typically a, a, a thing of the gameplay. It's it's a behavioral, it's a behavior that emerged from the overall semantics around those objects. Under the hood, mm -hmm. the graphic, the all the engines don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there might be a couple sources where, so, so generally speaking, if an entity is visible to multiple people and it's the same entity and it's not you know in the same place for both people mm -hmm. um, then in general that's a bug and uh, I guess we'd like to know about the repro case for that so mm -hmm. that we can have somebody try to fix it now there are some subtleties to that 
um, for example, um, the system is intended to be um, eventually consistent and best and 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 essentially um, best case uh, simulation. So we do have the semantics, for example, of an object being held uh, in the hand of an avatar. And it, it, if you had three computers, you know, kind of on uh, sitting next to each other, or you somehow had some live video link that you could see the scene of the three different computers. It could be that um, where the hand of the avatar is is in three different places uh, in the moment in the split screen, um, but that the entity is always in the hand. Um, that would be the expected behavior, right? So. Um, in that case, it's possible that in the eventually consistent and best case simulation world, you know, where Sam's hand is at the moment for me is, you know, a couple pixels off or even maybe a couple angles of rotation off because I have not yet processed the avatar mixture information about the pose of his hand um, to Philip, who's looking at it and has gotten the avatar data sooner than I did, right? Um, nice. or it's possible that I'm running in the new um, high quality mode in the graphics settings and so I'm simulating at 60 hertz and someone else on a lower end machine has been intentionally chosen low quality mode and so they're, they're simulating at 10 hertz and so obviously between 60 hertz and 10 hertz right uh, you know at 60 hertz it's um, you know 16, 16 milliseconds seconds. per frame at 10 hertz it's 100 milliseconds per frame so you know, 84. There's an 84 millis. There's a potential 84 millisecond difference in in the two different scenes. And 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 if if Sam's moving his hands quickly, then clearly that's going to be enough to see a, a difference between the two. Um, but semantically, the object should still be in Sam's hand for all of us. Um, so if it's something like that, then that could be people seeing it in different ways. Um, if it's really not that, if it's like um, you know, oh, and by the way, like an object that's got some projectile. Uh, motion to it or something like that those also can be simulated on slightly different frequencies but they are intended to ultimately you know resolve to the same semantic thing right so if it's if it's a small difference that could be expected if it's a significant difference that's a bug we'd yep. like to know how you caused it and we'd like to fix it mm -hmm. More questions? Does yeah, that is that is that the level that you guys were expecting? I wasn't even expecting slides. This is awesome. Thank you so much. You did a fantastic job. Yeah. Sweet. Yes, really nice slides. Really, really fantastic. I thought this would be like some geek fool. All right. I don't Sam know what is you're a talking about, but skilled presenter. Take a long talk, but it really taught us. <laughs> Thanks a lot, also Sam. Us non -coders Yay. A lot of our engineers. Yeah, Sam is always does a great job of that. Thank you. Cool. Well, um, I think that on our sl our time yes, now, our we are going to pivot to the actual uh, um, monthly open source meeting. Open source stuff. Yeah. Um.